All right, good afternoon and welcome. I am gonna get us started. We have a lot to share today, so we wanna stay on um, time. Thank you for joining us for today's Counselor Connect session. My name is Amanda Colhan. I am the coordinator for Counselor Connect. We are really glad you're here for today's session, which is session two of our comprehensive school counseling series. Uh, the first session was held in December and is now available on demand in case you missed that. I will include a doodle poll towards the end of our session today so that we can then schedule session three in the series. So um, if you're interested in being able to available to join that session three, please um, make sure you complete the doodle poll so that we can then schedule it um, based on the popularity of the dates uh, selected. I want to um, start off by wishing everybody a very happy National School Counseling Week. Uh, thank you for the great work that you are doing. This is a great week to not only celebrate and honor the role of school counselors, but also to educate on our role. Um, many people, even, even some people in the school um, setting, don't fully understand and know what we're trained to do and what we should really be spending our time doing in the schools to support students and families. So again, thank you. Happy National School Counseling Week. Hopefully you will have an awesome week as we celebrate um, the great work that, that you're all doing. With that, I'm going to introduce today's presenters. We have Lizette. She is a school counselor at a high school in Fishers, which is a part of Hamilton Southeastern Schools. Angie Ness is from Elkhart Community Schools and is a school counseling specialist. So they can share a little bit more about themselves if they wish. But with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to, I believe Lizette is going to get us started. Awesome, thank you so much. I am gonna um, share my screen and while I'm setting that up, if you wouldn't mind just stop dropping your name in the chat and what level you work at, whether it's elementary, middle, junior high, or high school, just we're gonna do a breakout and I think in a few minutes and just wanna have that information. Well, wow. Angie, do you mind sharing your screen? I'm sorry, my screen is not letting me share it right now for some reason. Thank you. Perfect. And if you want to go back to that slide um, five. Perfect, we've got a lot of different people on here. I see high, some fellow high school people, middle school, some elementary, um, working in higher ed. Awesome, welcome so much. Thanks for being here with us today. Um, we are really gonna just do a deep dive into what comprehensive school counseling looks like in the different levels um, when we look at it from a tiered approach today. So I definitely like us to have some interactions. So we'll be doing some breakout things and um, just to have us all be able to interact today. So our objective today is discover ways to implement tier one, tier two, and three interventions, support and access to the school counselor, to also learn to utilize data to support your students and your whole school. You can go to the next one. Sorry, Angie. All right. So we, um, you guys went over this last meeting, and this is an awesome graphic from Hatching Results um, that I really enjoy. And as you can see on it, we have the different levels. And you guys, I think, believe, had some homework from this as well, where when we look at our school counseling program, services that we have for all fall in that tier one. So what do we want all students to learn that fall under our area of school counseling? Tier two is what do we want some students? What are some students who based on data need to be provided some additional support in the area of academic, college, career, or social emotional? And the very top is our few. So who are the few students that need to receive services and what kind of services are we providing to them? And so on your homework, you were supposed to identify one to two student outcome data elements for your school counseling program to consider. 
um, and then fill in the tier one strategies and interventions for your school counseling program. Um, so we're going to go over the tier one strategies here in a few minutes, but if you want to drop in the chat, maybe one or two outcome data elements that you were going to look at for your school counseling program. And if you weren't here last week and you're not sure what we're talking about, we will cover it again. But if you want to drop that information in the chat so we can see some of the elements that your school is looking at related to school counseling. Attendance rate, weekly, yearly, awesome. Attendance, attendance. It's popular, I know, <laughs> right now. Any other ones you guys are thinking of? Tardies, college entrance scholarships. Definitely. Credit recovery, yeah. So I think what's what's hard is we get, we find all these data points, right? And it's like, how am I as one person supposed to address all of this? Or how am I, you know, supposed to help create a program to be able to address these things? And that's where we really look at that tiered approach. And we start viewing, instead of it being a position focused, meaning you're the only one in your building that knows how to address SEL issues, instead of, um, instead looking at as a more program focus. Um, and I should, at the very beginning, I should introduce myself a little bit more. So my name is Lizette Bowen. I've been a school counselor for 13 years. I've worked primarily just at the middle school and high school level, um, been at the high school level here for a few years. Um, and it's been really interesting seeing how all the different levels approach um, a tiered approach to comprehensive school counseling. Um, I did a very short-lived internship in elementary school and realized that was not the fit for me. I am not meant to be an elementary counselor. For those of you that are, congratulations, you're amazing. Um, but I want to just take a minute to look at this screen together. So I want you to do a little bit of a rating scale for yourself and rate yourself on each of these areas. Again, this is from Hatching Results. So when you view yourself as a, as a counselor right now, are you spending your more time being reactive counseling or proactive preventative? Okay. So I want you to just kind of go through each of these questions and tally up where you kind of think you are. And if you have questions about what any of the questions mean, feel free to drop it in the chat or ask. It's for about another minute or so. And you don't have to worry about your tally unless you're just really wanting to know your total points. Um, but really what I want you to think about here is out of all of these, which of these do you feel like you wanna grow the most in? So maybe perhaps you wanna grow the most in turning from reactive to being proactive. And I know that that takes time. I know it takes time to have time to plan to be proactive, time to review the data, but maybe that's the one or two, one of the ones that you want to work on this next year. We really want our session today to be focused on giving you strategies and giving you support so that you can move your program from it being a position focused to a program focus. So if you want to drop in the chat, maybe one of the ones that you would like to improve on. And you could just either type, you know, guards the status quo or gatekeeper rigorous courses. So go ahead and drop those in the chat. What's the one that you would personally like to work on? Awesome, thank you for sharing, Carmen. Great, got some coming in already. Feel free to keep typing those in. Yeah, being in a new school and the role looks completely different from my previous role. Definitely understand that. I'm sure we all can understand that. Proactive versus reactive, focus on outcomes, clearly defined roles and collaboration, focusing on outcomes again. 
And we're definitely going to talk about focusing on those outcomes today. Awesome. Thanks for sharing those. It looks like the most popular one is like that outcomes, focusing on the outcomes from the services provided. So feeling like at the end of the day, you can make a measurable difference because I know that everything has to be measured in education, right? So making a measurable difference in the lives of our students and in our school. Awesome. Okay. We're going to go to the next slide, Angie. So, um, I think we're going to go, Amanda, we're, I think we have enough people to do breakouts. Um, I didn't see as many though elementary people. So we'll probably do elementary and middle school together and then high school separate. Is that okay, Amanda? Yep, so elementary, middle and high. Yep, I'm just changing. All right, so we're gonna go into breakouts and Angie's gonna be in one room and I'm gonna be in the other one. And we're gonna just talk through some of these questions and challenges. Um, I understand some of you are like, I'm scarfing down my lunch. Don't You don't have to turn on camera if you don't want to, but just having some time to interact. We'd like to do that. So she's going to send you Liz into your rooms. Yeah. Lizette, um, how much time about do you want? to? to um, probably time? about five minutes or so. It's pretty short. Okay. Yep. Okay. I'm going to, in just a second, I'm going to open up the two rooms and you will just go ahead and self-select the room that you want to go to. Perfect. All right. Here we go. You should see that on your screen. You should be able to choose the room you want to go to. I think I mean it's not sending me into my room. <laughs> Which one do you want to join and I'll send you there. Sorry. I'm going to go, what'd you say? I'm sorry. I got it. I think I got it now. Okay. Yeah, Anybody can... else who isn't able? Yep. Tell me your name and where you want to go if you're not seeing it and I'll send you there. I'm Carmen Colmella. I'd like to go to elementary. Okay. Carmen elementary. Okay. There you go. You might be asked to join. If so, hit join. Anybody else need to join a room that wasn't able to do it? Um, this is Sarah Hardesty. I need to go to elementary. Okay, there you go. I'm through the Harvey. I'm trying to get to middle. Okay, I'm gonna send you there. Okay. I'm Amy Deusing. I just joined late because I had a student issue. So I think if I understand right, I probably need to go to a middle school room. Okay, sending you there now. Thank you. So Angie, I'll have you share your screen again since mine is not cooperating. I don't think the other group's back yet. Okay. <laughs> have you share? Say that again, Lizette. You need me you to share it again? again? Yeah. Okay. Mine's still not working. Perfect. Well, thank you for the great discussion. This on, um, I hope it was helpful in your group as well to really just lay the stage of we wanted to know where everybody was at with this work to be able to dig in and give you ideas and see where everyone is at. So you can go ahead and move on to the next one. Perfect. So I want you right now is just, I want you to rank where you currently spend most of your time. So as a school counselor at your school currently, what percentage of the time do you feel like you spend at tier one, tier two, and tier three? So just, just a ballpark. And if you want to be brave and put that in the chat, just for some conversation, that is fine as well. So what percentage do you feel like you're really at that tier one, which is all students, tier two, some or few. I definitely have had the days where it was all tier three all day working with certain students or families. Right. Okay. 
Perfect. Okay. You can go on to the next one, Angie. All right, so we are gonna do a little bit of a jam board um, and share your current tier one services. We always feel like it's helpful to learn from other people and it's a chance for us to learn from each other. Before we dig into our ideas and the things that we do, we're gonna have you just go to this bit.ly and we'll share this jam board and she put it in the chat as well. So go ahead and click on the bit.ly. And if you haven't done a jam board before, it's a chance for you to enter things in on the slides. So enter in things on this, let me, enter things on here that you feel like your school is currently doing at your tier one. I'm trying to click on the link, but it's not opening up. I'm not getting it to work either. Just a second. If it's not gonna work, we'll just move on. Let me try it one more time. So if you, um, the link, like if you're trying to click on the screen, it won't go, but there's a link in the chat. If you go over to the chat, you can copy and paste it there. And we've got some people adding in some ideas here. So small group counseling, social emotional lessons, few, this is just your tier one, few limited classroom lessons, PBIS, SEL through mentoring period, PBIS curriculum, package programs, conscious discipline, PBIS, delivered through guidance lessons. These are great ideas. Second step, yep. These are all great ideas of things that you can do at tier one, planning for all students, individual student planning. I think as high school counselors, sometimes we're like, where do we fit in? I don't have a certain period of the day to do this, but things that you're already doing in your practice, like doing four-year planning, um, meetings about planning for college or post-secondary um, plans, all of those fall into tier one. It does not have to just be SEL focused. Thinking even about any academic things that you do. So um, what are some academic things that you provide for all students? Are there times that you ever, um, you know, provide your teachers with information related to academic um, success, how to study, how to study for tests, how to transition from middle school to high school. All of those things can fall in those tier one services that you're doing. Trans transcript reviews, yes, schedule building. Those are tier one when we look at them through the lens of providing opportunities for students to take classes um, versus it just being the schedule input. Minute meetings. I love minute meetings. Those are my favorite thing to do in middle school where it was just like, I'm going to sit outside of a teacher's classroom and I'm going to pull in every kid from the class. And we're just going to, I'm going to ask them four questions. We're going to just touch base. I want to have a chance to touch base with every single one of my seventh graders that year. Awesome. These are all great ideas. Love this. Okay. I'm going to challenge you now to go to that at the top. You click the slide where it goes over and it'll say, share your tier two services. Let's put in some tier two services. What are things that you do now? So at the very top of that Jamboard, there's a next frame. I think a few of you have found it where you can do post-its of tier two services, small group counseling lessons, focused counseling groups, partnerships with community organizations, love that. Yes, small groups based on Panorama, MTSS, IEP meetings, Callahue, collab meetings, love it. Counseling focus groups, staffing with teachers, admin, services on behalf of student needs, restorative circles, love that. Lots of awesome ideas. Individual counseling sessions, awesome. Great. Okay, let's do our tier three now. Staffings with stakeholders, consultation team meetings. Yeah. Okay. So do the next slide over, and we're gonna we're gonna um, 
put together our tier three. And we, we will try to do a summary where we can send these out to at the end. So you guys do have access to this. Referral to outside agency, individual counseling meetings. All those acronyms we love, BIP, IEP, FBA, adult and child referrals, parent meetings. Awesome. Peer mediations. That takes me back to my middle school days for sure. Parent meetings. Awesome. Outside referrals. You guys got it. I think Angie, I don't even know if we have to do the whole session. I think they know the ideas of what we've got here. These are great. Thank you guys for doing that. All right. So we're going to go back. I got a couple more peer mentors. Love that. Awesome. All right, let's go back to our slide now where we're at. Thanks for doing that, you guys. We want to dig in next to, you can go ahead and hit the next one, Angie. So when we look at tier one examples, we have to look at it through the lens of what are the services for all? And it has to be viewed through the lens of academic services, college and career, and social emotional. Um, so what are the things that we're doing for all students? So what is the process to see the counselor? What are the whole grade counseling lessons that we do every year? Um, for your planning, family workshops, um, definitely those needs assessments like Panorama will give us some information related to what all students need. Um, and then some district resources. Sometimes a lot of districts have put together kind of some resources on their websites for parents to access. So I wanted to go into tier one access next. You can select, okay. So one thing that happened during um, the time that we were all at home or we were back and forth in virtual was definitely a time of reflection of figuring out like, how can students access me better? And I, as a high school counselor, it's hard to sometimes reach all 450 of my kids consistently. And so there are things that I came up with during that time that I still am utilizing today. And so a couple things that I still do is I do a web-based referral link. So um, I have in my email signature, for example, where a student can sign up for a meeting for me through Calendly. So they can sign up for a meeting for me. I have like a set time limit depending on what I want to send them. Also for those parents that you email back and forth and are like, let's set up a time to meet. And you go back and forth like 15 times on email. You can just send them your calendar link and they select the time and when they would like to meet with you. Um, so when we think about tier one, we have to think first of how we want the students to access us. How do we want all students and families and teachers to access the counselor and the counselor resources? Um, we allow our students to select times of when they sign up for their senior scheduling meetings or their senior um, fall meetings when we talk about planning for a to attend college and enlist in the military or go into an apprenticeship. So it allows them to have that kind of ownness of selecting a time to meet with us so they know that we are available and they can do that. We definitely still send passes. We definitely still have students stop by and sign up to see us, but having a clear cut plan of how all students access the counselor is really important in your comprehensive school counseling because we know the tier three kids that will find you right they'll find you at lunch duty they'll find you all the time um, but making sure that the whole all students in addition to those tier two and tier three students that receive your services that all students have access to the counselor and they know how to access you is really important when we view a comprehensive school counseling program the next slide, really, we go into what is the tier one programming and planning. And so I've got a little um, screenshot of our Canvas page, but really taking the time to ask your question, ask yourself as a department or with your administrative team, what do we want all students to know in the area of academic career and SEL? What do we want all students to know in these areas? And how do we wanna deliver these lessons? So what is our priority? And this tier one might be across the district, like the whole district is saying we're doing second steps. But the things that you are kind of directing in those conversations, what do we want all students to know? There's been such a focus on, on SEL, you know, positive and negatively over the last year. Um, thinking about even in the area of academics, do we want all sixth graders to know how to use a planner? And, and what is the lesson that accompanies that? Who delivers that lesson? And when does that happen? 
Do we want all students to be able to do a four-year course plan? Do we want all students to be able to identify their triggers? What are the things you want your students all to know? And how do we deliver those? So you can deliver those through Canvas. Definitely when we were virtual a lot, we did a lot of like workshop Fridays where we would do like a little mini lesson, kind of that flipped classroom lesson mod, um, style. And then we utilize Canvas a lot. So a lot of information, we will make short little videos on this is how you access um, this is how you plan in Skyward for your four-year course plan, or this is how you use Naviance to be able to do a transcript request. All of those, those kind of knowledge building things, mapping that out and figuring out what we want students to be able to know and do as a result of our school counseling services. Um, thinking of how you want to make a partnership with another educator. So if a um, another teacher in your building is passionate about a topic like working together because I feel like us partnering with other educators in our building makes those lessons stand out so much more. Obviously, you'll probably have some whole district SEL resources and then also some parent education opportunities. What do we want all sixth grade parents to know about moving into the middle school building? What do we want all freshman parents to know? What do they what do we want them to leave junior goals night with knowing? So thinking about what we want them all to know and how we want to deliver those lessons is really at the core of that tier one planning. Next, we're going to go into the tier two examples. So with tier two, the best way I know to summarize it is it's intentional, data-driven services to address identified needs. So small groups to address those concerns. And, you know, there are therapeutic groups and there are skill-based groups. And a lot of times the skill-based groups um, are a lot of times fall on school counselors, especially if you have a school social worker in your, in your district that supports with those things. Sometimes they'll do more of the therapeutic things. So working with your other staff or your other resources, addressing failing grades, consultation with families, those building level assistance team meetings, you know, using the data from those meetings to address student identified needs. And then when we look at the next one and look at the access and identification again. So how do students who need to receive tier two services access the counselor and how are they identified? So identification of those students that receive tier two services, how do you do that? Are they through academic referrals from teachers, um, SEL or behavior related um, concern referrals from maybe your deans, your assistant principals? Is there something you're utilizing perhaps in Naviance? Um, if you have Naviance at, at your school, at the high school or junior high level, do you have Naviance and you know, you're seeing that students aren't completing an interest inventory or students need additional support in figuring out what those next steps, they always answer IDK, you know, what do you wanna do when you finish high school? I don't know, I don't know, IDK, you know, like those are, those are responses are the ones that can help you identify some students that can use extra support in college and career area. And then obviously self sign up for groups and workshops. I always, I mean, different years when I was at the middle school level, I would always have students that wanted to, you know, join a different group or have a different group or students that I was seeing constantly for the same, you know, friendship type issue instead of spending 45 minutes with them, you know, and then the next day and the next day, I would have a lot of those students in a group together and we would talk about those issues once a week during lunch. So using that, how they access us, you are in charge of how how they can access you and really kind of taking charge of that is empowering as a school counselor. So next, as we look at tier two planning and programming, what do we want targeted students? So this targeted group of students, that are gonna receive tier two services. What do we want them to know or have access to in the area of academic career and SEL? And how do we wanna deliver these interventions? So that's when we see those small groups, whether they're therapeutic or skill-based, teacher mentoring group. So if you have a teacher, I, you know, would at times have teachers who would mentor students for me, just a two by 10, like let's check in for, you know, two minutes and let me know how things are going in the hallway. Some of those things are so impactful to have someone mentoring and checking in with them. Um, if you have a community mentoring program, we're lucky in um, the part of Indiana where I'm at, we have a youth mentoring initiative, which is an outside organization that comes in and does a mentoring program with our students. Family book studies, that's a great opportunity um, to help families. You know, some of the families who maybe have um, 
a student's going to be a first generation college um, student, um, do a family book study with a group of, of group of those families to kind of talk through this is what the process is going to look like. And this is the this is these are ways that you can support your student, um, you know, food and resource support. Definitely the career and college based planning I can see in this targeted tier two. We um, in middle school level, if you have your student sign up for 21st century scholars, like what are you doing differently at the high school level once they come to you to be able to support them to get to utilize that college scholarship? What programs are you allowing into your building to talk about apprenticeship or military or other resources of things that your student wants to pursue? And then finally, you, you are kind of the person who can allow access to those community sports and partnerships. We ran a BP-8, which is a Brooks Place grief group this last year, and um, allowing our students to self-select for that grief group, as well as sending out the information to their, their parents as well, was super helpful. And that BP-8 gr group was something I co-facilitated, but they come in and run, and it's completely you know free for your program to do it. So those are just some of those planning and program when we look at tier two. And then finally at that tier three examples, these are the few, right? And I know I feel I have been a counselor long enough to know that sometimes those tier students who need that tier three support, you know, can take up 50% of your day. Um, so utilizing individual targeted time-based intensive intervention. And I think the time-based is so hard to do being honest with you, but I think it is so important to have a time-based intensive intervention. You cannot do an individual check-in with a student two times a day for the entire school year. It's just not possible. You're going to have sickness, you know, you're going to get the dreaded call that your kid's in quarantine or whatever may happen. You cannot put that on yourself to do that an entire school year. So you've got to focus on time-based intensive um, intervention for those tier three students who need tier three services. So when we look at tier three on the next slide, access and identification, what do we, yeah, sorry, answer question. When you say time-based, what do you mean short-term? Yes, I believe in, in short-term and then a check-in and reassess. It cannot be, we're gonna do this the whole year without having a check-in and a review of how things are going. And we know how quickly the school year goes that it can be really quickly and it's spring break. Um, and so that's why I say time-based. So I say, we're going to, I'm going to check in with you for the next three weeks and, and we're going to see how you're doing. And then I'm going to move you to, we're going to check in every other day. And then I'm going to move you to, I'm going to check in once a week and we're going to be in a group, you know, just having that time-based because again, you are in control of the access your students have to you and being intentional allows you to feel more empowered when it goes, when it comes to your time. So the tier three access and identification, what do we want few students to know or have access to in the area of academic career SEL? And how do we wanna deliver these interventions? So we wanna assess our current supports and see what is and what is and is not working. So if a student, is in a current support and it's not working, what is working? Identification of those students who need to receive tier three services, you know, perhaps looking at those academic referrals, working, having that constant line of communication with your deans, assistant principals to see what they're, what's happening in their area of the building. And then also your access and identification might come from concerns from your families. You know, they've, they've noticed something has been challenging with a student or their student feels off, you know, making sure your parents and your families have access to you as a counselor and they know how to access you, going back to that tier one strategy, allows them to voice those concerns in a way that allows you to be more proactive than just at that complete crisis moment. So when we look at the next slide, slide of tier three planning and program, you know, looking at intensive time-based strategies, whether it's those check-ins planned with a goal, I've written down, this is our goal of what, when we're gonna meet, these are the coping strategies you're gonna utilize. We're gonna rate yourself on how well you use those coping strategies. Just having really a lot of structure on something as intense as a counselor check-in is really important. Obviously you're gonna be doing some crisis support, whether it's a student who has been hospitalized, um, for a mental health crisis. What does that look like when they come back in? So having that ahead of time planned out, well, our expectation is you're gonna have, 
you know, we're going to meet with the family or I'm going to meet with a student. I'm going to talk about any triggers that happen within the school day. Having that kind of mapped out and planned ahead of time makes you feel more empowered when that crisis does come because we know those crises do come. And then um, having that family referral for services. So what is what does that procedure look like to refer a family for additional services or supports? So I know I went over kind of a lot of information um, and I have a tendency to talk a little bit quickly, but what I really want you to get from this is I want you to feel empowered of how you can determine how your students have access to you as a counselor, how you can be involved in the identification process, and then what interventions you have available. And again, this is not meant to be, I'm going to go do all of this tomorrow, but is, what is there, is there one thing that you could implement tomorrow or this week or next school year that would help you feel more hopeful and more like you can approach the comprehensive school counseling model without just feeling overwhelmed or feeling like I don't have time for that. This is one more thing. Because I know as counselors, we all went into this counseling field because we wanted to make a difference for kids. And it's hard to see, see light of that sometimes um, with things that are going on in the last couple of years that have happened. So I just really encourage you to think of one thing that you could utilize in your program to help you move that needle closer to that comprehensive school counseling model. Um, I'm Angie's going to kind of dig into the data next, and she is awesome and has so much information to share. If you have other questions too, feel free to continue to kind of put those in the chat, and I will let her take over. Thanks, Lizette. I will ask for your help though, Lizette, because since I have my screen shared, I can't see the chat. So if there's something in there, if you would let me know, that would be helpful. Absolutely. And then um, just a little bit more about me. I'm Angie. I am in my eighth year as a school counselor. Um, this is my first year in a high school. I've spent five years at the elementary level and a couple of years at the middle school. So I have a pretty broad range of knowledge about school counseling, but data is pretty much the same everywhere. So um, when it comes to moving from positions to programs, data is going to be like one of the most important things that you do. Knowing, having data and knowing what you're trying to target is going to be the difference between providing random acts of guidance versus having outcomes for your students. So a lot of times we are not sure where to start. What data do we use? So here in Elkhart County, we had the um, Lilly Grant. And one of the things that we did as a result of that was to talk about what those data triggers are going to be in academic career and, or academic behavior and attendance. So you can see on this um, chart here, what we ideally as school counselors would be pulling every quarter of the school year to kind of screen the whole school to see what's going on and where kids might need a little extra support. Um, so again, it's gonna look a little bit different at the elementary school versus the middle school versus the high school. I was very surprised when I got to the high school, usually in elementary or middle school, we're just making sure that they're passing their core classes, language arts, math, social studies, and science. But the high school, they all matter. So um, we have to make sure that they're not failing any classes. So think about what kind, different kinds of data you can think of outside of what you might get in your SIS programs. Um, go ahead and put in the chat what you might think of as that might be considered data that you could kind of inform your program with. Um, needs assessments from students and staff families, needs assessments, survey responses. Yep, absolutely. I know when we did number of suspensions, yes. I can't see it now that I did something else. Thanks, was that? Mm -hmm. Behavior and discipline data. Pre and post tests for interventions, yep. Attendance, absolutely. We wanna make sure that those kids that are missing lots and lots of school will figure out what's going on and give them support if they need it. Some things that people don't often think about um, are minute meetings. That's data. When you talk with kids, 
you're getting some cont contextual data about what's going on with them. Um, observations are data. When you go into a classroom, when you go out to recess and observe what's going on, that's data. Anytime that you consult with staff, parents, administrators, anybody in the community, that's data. It's important data. Data to show gaps with your marginalized communities, absolutely. We will talk about that a little bit more. Um, your use of time, where are you spending your time? Are you spending more of your time doing non-counseling duties or are you spending the majority of your time doing direct and indirect services with your students? And what are you using that time with? Do you have a lot of kids coming down because they're being bullied? Do you have a lot of parents calling because of grading practices? All of that is uh, data. Uh, graduation rates, I'm not sure that that was put in the chat yet, but types of diplomas that are earned. You know, if you have a large majority of your students um, that maybe are getting the general diploma for some reason, that's something to understand. And then I do think we talked earlier about whole school screeners like Panorama. So lots and lots of different types of data. So of course, there's quantitative, which are the numbers that you get, and qualitative, which are the stories. And I say that you can never do one and not do the other because they both kind of round out the entire picture. So I can look at attendance and see that so many kids are missing five or more days, but I don't know the reason. Is there an issue with the families? Is there an issue with students not wanting to come to school? We need to dig in and find out the qualitative, the the reasons and the context behind those numbers. Okay, so we're gonna talk about proportional data because when we look at data, sometimes we just take the numbers for what they are, don't think much about it, um, but we need to make sure that our data is proportional. And that means that the figures are corresponding in size or amount to something else. So you have, um, an example of some things, some data that I collect uh, in my own schools. And this is just an example, this is not actual data. So you can see uh, the number of students with two or more absent core subjects. I know the total number, I have it broken down by um, ethnicity and free and reduced lunch and um, gender and whether they are receiving special education services, but that really doesn't tell me much. I know the number but I don't know if it's proportional or not. So the next thing that I need to make sure that I do is switch everything to percentages. Um, for instance, if um, nine females or if my, yeah, I need to do percentages. That's kind of comparing apples to apples versus apples to oranges. So that in itself still does not give us the full picture. So what we need to do, which you see in the top row, um, which is in yellow, is you need to find out the overall demographics of your school. So I can see that 44% of my school is male, 56% identifies as female, 8.5% um, receive special education services, et cetera, et cetera. So I can see what the makeup is of my school population. So I can compare it to um, my grade and attendance and behavior data to see if it's proportional. So when we look at the number of males that are receiving two or more Fs in core subjects, we can see that that is not proportional. If this data was proportional, we should only have 44% of our males receiving two or more Fs. We see that we have 56%. That is um, a big discrepancy. Uh, you also often see that if you've taken time to look through your data, you often see that um, with free and reduced lunch, with your students receiving special education services, and oftentimes with your students of color. Those are common areas of disproportionality, and those are things that we need to make sure that we look at because those are gaps in, in um, access potentially or gaps in services that we need to fix for our kids. So we got to think about what does that mean for our work as school counselors and what is our job in advocating for the systemic issues? Have you guys taken time to advocate for those things or have those difficult conversations with administrators? Okay. 
I know I've had quite the number of conversations with some of my past administrators about grading practices. Um, certain, we found that certain teachers were giving more Fs than the other teachers. So we had to kind of look at why that is. So where do we start? How do we think about program goals in order to use the data? Uh, the best thing that you probably should do and start to do is start with your school's school improvement plan. You will have um, what your school thinks is important to address. And that's usually where you should start to make your program goals. Then you find data that supports that goal and decide on interventions. So an example of a SIP that you see here um, is that most of the time, especially in elementary school, they're gonna look at academic goals. Um, for this one, I learn results, they want to increase the number of students earning passing grades or passing scores on language arts. So how does that relate to us as school counselors? Well, we find out data to find out what the reason is. Again, we're gonna disaggregate it. We're gonna see whether there's gaps in gender or gaps in ethnicity that might uh, play a part in that. We're going to talk to students and see um, maybe it's test anxiety that is kind of holding them up from doing as well as they should. We're gonna to talk to teachers and find out what they think is the reason that um, language arts scores are not higher. So again, it's not, there's a lot of things that school counselors can do. It involves getting a lot of data and finding out the big picture of what is going on. So I went through that really quickly too. Does anybody have any questions about some of the things that I kind of sped through or how I use data in my own schools? Or questions about how you might do it for yourself? Okay, so you had homework from the last time to kind of talk about data to inform your tier one. So this time, since we're, um, we're moving on, I want to challenge you to find a data point to identify some tier two and tier three student needs. Um, are you gonna look at your pre and post um, surveys from your classroom lessons that you're doing? Are you going to look at referrals that come to you from teachers and parents? Are you going to look at your discipline data? Think about what you might use as a data point to identify student needs. And then think about what other data is needed. Like I said before, you can't just rely on the numbers. You need to get some context and have some conversations. Sorry, I'm reading chat. Something you, or is it something that you are the only person that deals with tries to put in tier two and three services in place? So I think that depends on where you're working as far as you are the sole person that puts the services in place or whether it's a school initiative. Um, some, some schools, teachers are solely academic related and school counselors do all of the um, initiatives and the interventions. Ideally, it is something that everybody is doing. I think uh, Lizette had talked about it before, like she partnered with a classroom teacher um, and. So that's something that you wanna to do too. I know at uh, one of my last schools, we had a lot of students with a great number of discipline office referrals. And so we put together a check-in check-out process. Um, I did some kids the check-in check-out, our social worker took on some kids with check-in check-out. And then we also had some of our classroom teachers serve as those check-in check-out point people. So ideally it is a whole school, it's a whole team initiative because we want to make sure that students are served by everybody because there are gonna be some days that we're not there. We are part of the intervention. We are not the whole intervention as school counselors. I definitely think um, like my tier two students that receive those services at tier two and tier three, it's a, you know, the deans and the assistant principals know those students' names and we talk about those students. So it's definitely a effort for it not to just, as you said, that we are not the intervention, <laughs> that we are one of the interventionists. 
Okay, so yeah, back to making sure that you have all the data to make sure you know what the context and the understanding behind the issue is, whether it's friendship issues, whether it's uh, grades. And sometimes the interventions are not going to be um, for the kids, sometimes they're going to be to the staff. You know, if you have certain staff members that are disproportionately referring kids to the office for reasons that maybe they shouldn't be, that's a conversation that you can have with that staff member or with your administrator to kind of fix that. Um, I often find that a lot of times if we as adults change some things about how we view things and, and address things that uh, the issues with the kids kind of solve themselves. And then once we get all the data we need, we're gonna decide how we're going to work with our students. Are we going to do um, an additional lesson? Maybe we didn't teach everything we needed to teach in our classroom lessons and we need to go back and do it again in a different way. Are we going to do some small groups? Are we going to refer out? Are we gonna do check in, check out or something similar like that? So that's what you can work on for the next time. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, Angie and Lizette. I'm going to pause for just a minute, make sure we don't have any other questions that anybody wanted to ask. Um, if you wanna add anything to the chat, please feel free to do so. Or if you want to unmute yourself, you could do that as well. We wanna make sure your questions are answered before we sign off. In the meantime, while we are waiting to see if any more questions come in, I will share a couple of few slides here. Um, this is a shared Google folder that you have the link for now. This was actually put together by um, our session one presenters. So if you want to check out the resources that they shared during their session, we will also put in a sample um, kind of spreadsheet similar to what Angie just shared with us. Um, we'll add that to the resources folder here in the next few days. I try to get into the shared Google form. Can you put that into the chat? Yep, we'll do that in just a second here. And then while I'm also on this slide, I do want to share again the, um, I mentioned this previously, but the doodle for session three. If you are interested in joining that session three, please make sure you complete the doodle so that we can go with the most popular date and time for that session. Did somebody already put in the, looks like somebody already put in the resources folder. Thank you for doing that. All right, Angie, will you go ahead and move to the next slide and I will share our session evaluation for today. I'm gonna link that in as well. Please go ahead and fill that out, especially if you want any a PGP point for your participation in today's session. Um, by completing the session evaluation, you will automatically receive that PGP certificate. If you have any problems, please feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, we do have some upcoming events that we can share and highlight in our final slide here. Um, we are obviously celebrating National School Counseling Week this week, and each morning this week we are having coffee chats with school counselors who received the Exemplary School Counselor Awards in the fall at the ISCA conference. So please join us um, for those fun conversations as we hear from different counselors from the different levels. We have a winter book study going on um, if you are interested in joining that. And then uh, we've started our culturally responsive SEL series that kicked off in January. Our next session for that will be February 23rd. If you have not yet registered, please, um, you still can, there's still time. And um, we are planning a portrait of a graduate session for March 10th. So lots of fun things going on coming up here soon. So with that, I am going to check the chat again for any questions, I am not seeing any. So please fill out that session evaluation and that doodle poll. And we will then see you later this spring for session three. Thank you, everyone. Stay well and have a great school counseling week.